Good morning, folks, and welcome to my channel. Right now, it's about 4 a.m. on the East Coast in New York, but I still have to bring you guys this video. In this video, I will give you the easiest breakdown of the pathophysiology of psychosis, the mechanism of action of antipsychotics, the side effects, and the mechanism associated with that. This video is the second video in my antipsychotic series, and if it ends up being beneficial to you, all I ask for is to use literally one second to hit the like button. Thank you. Let's begin by breaking down this term, first-generation antipsychotics. The antipsychotic part simply means that these drugs are used to treat psych disorders. A psych disorder is a condition that affects the brain, causing a person to lose touch with reality and have abnormal perceptions and thinking. This is sometimes referred to as psychosis. The first generation portion is meant to help us differentiate these antipsychotics from a different type of antipsychotics known as the second generations. These two generations of antipsychotics have slight differences in the indications, the mechanism, side effects, and efficacy. The first gens were the first group of antipsychotics to be developed. I have a separate video covering the story behind how the first generation antipsychotics were discovered. Intro to antipsychotics. Link above if interested. The first generation antipsychotics can also be referred to as typical antipsychotics, conventional antipsychotics, or even neuroleptics. Now, before we learn more about the first generation antipsychotics, we need to understand what psychosis is. What's causing it? What are the changes in the body leading to it, right? What exactly is the problem? And then we can learn how or why the first generation antipsychotics are able to fix this problem. As mentioned previously, psychosis is a condition that affects the brain, causing a person to lose touch with reality and have abnormal perceptions and thinking. The signs and symptoms that these patients present with can be placed into three categories, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. The term positive refers to presence of symptoms rather than their absence. It's positive as in a plus sign, excess. It doesn't mean that the symptoms are good or bad. Instead, these symptoms add on to what would be considered normal experiences. Examples include hallucinations, so seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, or smelling things that aren't there. Delusions. Believing things that are untrue, such as someone trying to harm you. Disorganized thinking or speaking. Speech may be fast or constant, or the person may switch topics mid-sentence. The term negative symptoms, in this case, refers to a loss or absence of normal behaviors. Think negative as in minus. These symptoms take away from what will be considered normal experiences. They are behaviors or emotions that are deficient or lacking in people with psychosis. Examples include anhedonia. The person may not seem to enjoy all the things they used to enjoy anymore. A sociality. This symptom can include a lack of social drive or an increased desire to spend time alone. It can also make it difficult to socialize with others or to hold down a job. Avolition. This symptom can make it difficult to initiate or persist in purposeful activities, such as eating, showering, paying bills, or buying groceries. Cognitive symptoms. These symptoms reflect how well the person's brain learns stores and uses information. Someone with schizophrenia or psychosis might have a hard time with their working memory. For example, they may not be able to keep track of different kinds of facts at the same time, such as a phone number plus instructions. The complexity of these signs and symptoms also translates to the complex pathophysiology. Till now, there are many different hypotheses and proposed mechanisms as to why psychosis occurs. The most common is related to dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter or a chemical messenger in the brain responsible for carrying messages from one area of the brain to the next. The messages that dopamine carries around regulates certain behaviors such as motivation, decision-making, addiction, and voluntary movements. 
So low dopamine levels can make it difficult to leave bed or to eat and can lead to feelings of tiredness and lethargy. Whereas people with higher dopamine levels are more likely to focus on the benefits of a task and choose it, even if it's difficult. Certain drugs produce large surges of dopamine, which can reinforce the connection between the drug, the results in pleasure, and external cues linked to the experience. This can lead to uncontrollable cravings, even when the drug isn't available, resulting in possible addiction. Let's see how dopamine execute these functions on the cellular level. To understand this, you need to learn about something known as the dopamine pathway. Dopamine is produced in three main parts of the brain. The ventral tegmental area, or VTA, the substantia nigra, and lastly, hypothalamus, even though it's not identified here. For dopamine to function, it moves from an area where it's produced to a target area in the brain. Neurons originating from the areas of production is what takes the dopamine to the target areas. This is what we call dopamine pathways. The movement of dopamine from its birthplace to the target areas. Here are the three most common pathways. In each pathway, dopamine will cause a specific function by binding to its receptor. Let's visualize this. Assume this is a neuron originating from the substantia nigra, and it has some dopamine in there that it's taken to the target location, which is another area in the brain. Within the dopaminergic neuron, the dopamine is stored within these vesicles. At the target area, the dopamine will be released into the space in the middle here called the synaptic cleft. The dopamine would then bind to the dopamine receptors. This leads to an internal reaction and then the results and function. Now it's important for us to learn about the different types of dopamine receptors since we may see different effects depending on which one the dopamine binds to. Now there are five distinct types of dopamine receptors categorized into two families based on their structure and function. First family is D1-like receptors which consist of D1 and D5 receptor. D1 receptor is responsible for increasing the brain's activity or excitation. D5 is more for cognitive symptoms like learning and memory. Second family is the D2-like receptors, which consist of the D2, D3, and D4 receptors. D2 receptor is the most well-known of the D2-like receptors and is heavily involved in reward processing and movement regulation. D3 is associated with motivation, reward, and drug addiction. And lastly, D4 is involved in impulse control, attention, and personality traits. Okay, so we have a solid foundation on dopamine and how it functions, taking into consideration its receptors and dopaminergic pathways. So now we can discuss the pathophysiology of psychosis, and it will be easier to understand because I will use some of these terminologies that we just covered. So initially, prior to the 1950s, the pathophysiology of psychosis was not well understood. Understood. This all changed in the 1950s when the dopamine hypothesis gained popularity. This hypothesis addressed the pathophysiology of the positive and negative symptoms associated with psychosis. As per the dopamine hypothesis, the positive symptoms like hallucinations, delusions, and disorganized symptoms are caused by an overactivity of dopamine transmission through the D2 receptors in certain brain regions, particularly the mesolimbic pathway. Negative symptoms like social withdrawal, anhedonia, and avolition is caused by a hypoactivity of dopamine transmission in the mesocortical pathway. In terms of what even triggers this dopamine imbalances or activity, it can be a combination of genetics, environmental factors, medications, and other factors. Anyway, by now you should have an understanding of what the problem is in psychosis. So now let's learn about how the mechanism as to how the first generation antipsychotics tries to fix this problem. Before we delve into that, let's meet the drugs in the class. So I have the generic names listed first and then the brand names in parentheses. So we have clopromazine, haloperidol, flufenazine, theoritazine, perfenazine, and loxapine. The mechanism of action of the first generation antipsychotics is not complex. The first generation antipsychotics mainly exert their therapeutic effects in the mesolimbic pathway, 
I already covered what that is, but again, that simply refers to a dopaminergic pathway where dopamine is transmitted from one area of the brain to the next. In this case, the pathway originates from the VTA and it ends in a different part of the brain called the limbic system. The reason why the first generation antipsychotics target this pathway is because that's where scientists believe the problem is, right? As per the dopamine hypothesis. In this pathway, the First generation antipsychotics occupy the D2 receptors and prevent dopamine from binding to it. This will lead to a decrease in the hyperactivity of the dopamine in this pathway and subsequently reduce the positive symptoms like delusions and hallucinations. But what about the negative symptoms? We did say that the negative symptoms are believed to be related to reduced dopamine activity in the mesocortical pathway. So then, do you think more blockade of dopamine in the mesocortical pathway will help with the negative symptoms? Not really. In fact, these agents have limited to no efficacy in treating negative symptoms and can potentially make it worse. This also includes the cognitive deficits since those symptoms can overlap with the negative symptoms. But wait, there is more. These agents are nonspecific, so they block the D2 receptors in the other dopaminergic pathways as well. And on top of all of that, they also bind to other non-dopamine receptors as well. So here's a list of all the dopamine pathways these agents may also block the D2 receptor at. The nigrostriatal pathway and the tuberal and fundibular pathway. And here are all the other receptors they can bind to. Just for your information, when we say blockade, it's the same as saying these agents are inhibitors at those receptors. Serotonin receptor blockade, alpha-1 adrenergic receptor blockade, histamine-1 receptor blockade, and lastly, muscarinic cholinergic receptor blockade. You're probably wondering, what is the resulting effect of the first generation antipsychotics binding to these other receptors that have nothing to do with fixing the psychosis? It's simple. That's how we get side effects usually. So let's play a little game. I will list some side effects on the left side and all the other pathways or receptors that the first generation antipsychotics work on. And based on the side effects, you have to match it to the correct receptor or pathway. First, drowsiness or sedation. That's due to which receptor activity? Correct, the histamine receptor blockade, just like how we see with antihistamines like Benadryl. Okay, next, orthostatic hypotension, which presents as dizziness or fainting upon standing up. This is due to which receptor or pathway activity? Correct, the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, right? It leads to vasodilation and reduced blood pressure. Next, we have the extrapyramidal symptoms or EPS, which is characterized by tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement, Tardive dyskinesia, which is involuntary movements, typically of the face and tongue. These symptoms are due to the blockade of D2 receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway. Excellent. Which is involved in the motor control. Next, dry mouth. This is due to the blockade of acetylcholine on the muscarinic receptors. What about blurred vision? This is due to the blockade of acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors also. And due to this inhibition, patients may also experience constipation and urinary retention. Next, weight gain. What do you think about that? Okay, good. That's due to the serotonin receptor inhibition. This can also be caused by inhibition of the histamine receptors and dopamine receptors in the hypothalamus, leading to interference with the regulation of hunger and satiety, resulting to increased food intake and other metabolic changes like diabetes. Lastly, we have hyperprolactemia. This one might be a little difficult, but the correct answer here is the tuberal infundibular pathway. Prolactin is a hormone that's responsible for lactation, certain breast tissue development, and milk production. Dopamine normally inhibits the release of prolactin. It does this by blocking D2 receptors in the tuberal and fundibular pathway, leading to an increase in prolactin secretion, resulting in milk production, enlargement of male breast or gynecomastia, and menstrual disturbances. That will bring our little game to an end. <laughs> but there's one more side effect I would like to cover. 
This one will get its own spotlight. This is called Neuroleptic Malignant Syndrome, or NMS. NMS is a potentially life-threatening condition that can occur after the use of first-generation antipsychotics. It is characterized by hyperthermia, or high fever, muscle rigidity, altered mental status ranging from confusion to delirium, and autonomic dysregulation, which presents as sweating, blood pressure changes, and tachycardia. The mechanism is not fully understood, but it is believed that there is a sudden and widespread blockade of dopamine receptors, particularly in the nigrostriatal pathways and hypothalamus. Not all individuals taking first-generation antipsychotics develop NMS, but certain factors can increase the risk, including high doses of the antipsychotic, rapid dose escalation, stressful events like an infection, surgery, or trauma, and concurrent use of other medications that influence the dopamine system. So for example, antiemetics like metoclopramide. If NMS is suspected, immediate intervention is crucial and treatment typically involves discontinuation of the offending antipsychotic agent, supportive care like hydration, cooling measures for the hyperthermia, etc. Medications to manage symptoms include Dantrolene, which is a muscle relaxant that can reduce muscle rigidity. Dopamine agonist like bromocryptine or amantadine that will help restore the dopamine activity. And benzodiazepines that causes sedation to help with the agitation. As you can see, the first generation antipsychotics do cause a lot of side effects. The silver lining in this is that the frequency and severity of the side effects is influenced by the potency. So we can pick the drugs based on the potency in case we want to avoid certain side effects. The drug potency refers to the strength of the drug binding affinity for the receptor and the effects. We can divide this into three categories, high potency, medium, and low potency. Haloperidol and flufenazine are considered high, perfenazine and loxapine medium, clopromazine and thyroidazine are low. We will compare the following side effects amongst these agents, so sedation or drowsiness, EPS, and anticholinergic side effects like dry mouth, blurred vision, and even constipation. The high potency agents tend to have less sedation and less anticholinergic side effects, but a higher EPS due to higher binding affinity for the D2 receptors. Sorry if these dashes look like french fries, but all it's trying to show is that these agents have a balanced effects when it comes to the following side effects. Lastly, the low potency agents tend to have more sedation and anticholinergic effects, but less EPS due to the weaker binding affinity of the D2 receptors. And that will bring this video to an end. Hopefully I was able to provide a good review of these agents. Look out for the next video covering the second generation antipsychotics. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment with any questions that you may have. Thank you for watching this video and take care.